We come now to the fourth lecture in our handout theology series. That's what is usually considered the greatest problem that faces any believer in a good God, namely evil. We've indicated the problem in our last lecture as a prelude to the consideration of it now, but now let's see if we can address it and perhaps focus on a satisfactory answer. Let me, following our usual procedure, just read these propositions without comment and then return to develop them more fully. I haven't said this before, friends, but it's understood that those of you who are taking this course by the videotapes may very well, after this half hour, open up a discussion among yourselves about any of these ten points or all of them or some other points as well. But number one, if God is good, and God is all, where did evil come from? Two, it didn't come from anywhere. It has no hiding place in the universe. It is no alien thing crept in from outside. There's nothing outside God. Three, it must have come from God, not from anywhere. There is no other where than God. Four, but it must have come from God's purpose, not his nature. God's nature, as seen, is good. Evil does not come from good. Only good comes from good. Six, five, so evil must have come by good, but not from good. Six, the goodness of God must have had a good purpose in bringing evil to pass. Goodness had a use for evil which it could not itself produce. Seven, we'll ask later, what was the good use for the bad? Now we want to know how God could bring evil into being without producing it himself. Eight, it must have come from the good creatures God made. Nine, but they, being good creatures, would seem to be no more capable of doing evil than their good creator. Ten, but creatures may change as their creator can not. Evil must have been a falling away from creature good which the good creature could have permitted for some seemingly good reason. Thus, enter evil. Look at number one. If God is good and God is all, where did evil come from? Now, Mary Baker Eddy gives us a very plain and very understandable answer to that question. On the surface of it, it seems to be the only answer to the question. And you can understand why millions of people have felt that that was a satisfactory and indeed the only satisfactory explanation of evil. God is all. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's immense. There's nothing outside him. He is all. And God is good. We all agree. And Mrs. Eddy concluded, and how can you escape it? All is good. Therefore, where did evil come from? Didn't come from anywhere. The problem solved. It doesn't exist. It couldn't exist. It's an illusion. Mrs. Baker would say it's Maya. Some of the Hindu thinkers would say. Many people, besides those who follow Mrs. Eddy, feel that this is a satisfactory explanation. And the only act explanation that is satisfactory, there is no evil. 
One thing you will admit for this reply, if it is sound, it is sufficient. If, on the other hand, it happens to be sound, unsound, then it's the curing of a headache by decapitation. And that happens to be the conviction of almost all other types of human beings beside the pantheists and the Christian scientists. And the reason for that is they just cannot accept the proposition that there is no evil. It exists everywhere. Even this particular address to it is an effort to explain it. You wouldn't even have had this little formula if there hadn't been evil provoking that as a kind of explanation. But however impeccably sound the explanation seems to be, it just won't work with most people because evil is immediately present. If people get in a predicament like this, they're very prone to say, I don't know what's wrong with your reasoning, but something's wrong. This conclusion does follow from those preceding premises, but something has to be wrong with them because this conclusion is wrong. There is evil. And many people will get indigna enough indignation up to say the proposition there is no evil is the ultimate evil. Denying evil is worse than any other kind of evil. It's a falsity. It's making the world out to be something other than it is. At any rate, we'll leave it there just on that ground that this is established as a verity. There is just no way around it. And if you don't know what's wrong with this, you know that it's wrong anyway because it comes to a conclusion which simply defies reality that anybody, be he a pantheist or a Christian scientist, recognizes as a miserable but undeniable reality. Number two, our answer is that it didn't come from anywhere. It has no hiding place in the universe. It is no alien thing crept in from outside. There's nothing outside God. You know, modern science fiction is full of these alien invaders and so on, some of them monstrously evil. But nevertheless, that's well called science fiction. There's no reality to that type of thing. And certainly, if there were, these evil beings would not actually be explained by telling us that they come from outer space. You just have to transfer the locality of the problem to this world, from this world to another world. But saying the evil originated elsewhere doesn't explain how evil originated. But the point is there really is no elsewhere. If God is omnipresent everywhere, then of course there's no place where God, the good God, actually is. Three, it must have come from God, not from anywhere. There is no other where than God. Now I know those of you who are listening to me or have read this particular statement know that I'm treading on very dangerous ground. It sounds to you as if I may be saying that God himself is evil. Now I'm driven to this repugnant conclusion because there is evil and there is no other where except God and the inference is God is the source of evil. I'm not saying that, notice, I'm not saying that he is the producer of it. All we're saying so far is that it must have come from him somehow because there is no other place from which it could come. There's no other where than God. Number four, but it must have come, since it must have come from God, it must have come from God's purpose 
not his nature. God's nature, as seen, is good. Evil does not come from good. Only good comes from good. All right, we've planted that fixation firmly. It can't be produced by a good God. He cannot do evil. It's got to be connected with him. It couldn't be without his involvement. But on the other hand, it's equally obvious that it could not have come from his very being or nature. As Jesus says, a good tree produces good fruit. Bad fruit comes from a bad tree. Evil deeds must come from some evil source. Which source couldn't exist without God? But which source could not be God? Because in his nature, he is altogether good. I think as I stress this point, you feel a kind of sympathy for Mrs. Eddy and others who've gone in this other way and saying a great deal of truth. God is all and God is good. It would look as if everything had to be good. She's perfectly right. Everything that comes from God, the good God has to be good. And from that observation being driven to the conclusion that evil can't come into being and therefore only seems to be and is actually an illusion, seems uh, inevitable, but we can't accept that. Evil is too present every moment of our existence for us to live with the idea, inviting as it may be, that evil does not exist. And so what we're saying to that type of solution is it's right in the sense that it recognizes that this evil could not come into being without God, but it goes too far in supposing that it actually doesn't exist because it couldn't come from God in any sense whatsoever. They're right when they say it couldn't come from his very goodness. And because they see no other option, they inevitably conclude it can't come from anywhere and therefore must only seem to be. But they're right up to a point. And we can understand why they can't seem to go any further. The kitchen is too hot and they're getting out. But the problem is still there. And there's no denying it. So we say in number five, evil must have come by good, but not from good. Couldn't possibly come from good. And it could not possibly come except by good. That's where we are driven for a solution who cannot deny the problem and live with the notion that there is no evil. It must have come by God. Even though no way could it come from God. To say it came from God is blasphemy. To say it didn't come from, come by God, I'm afraid in the last analysis is blasphemy also, though it's not nearly as obvious as in the other case. I'll have to let that rest, and you may want to thrash that one out in your subsequent discussions. Number six. <clears throat> the goodness of God must have had a good purpose in bringing evil to pass. Goodness has a use for evil, the very evil that it could not produce. All right, let's drive that conviction into the ground. God, the good God, must explain the existence of evil 
would never have come by him, and because he's a good God, it must have proceeded from his good purpose. A person with a good nature and nothing but a good nature always has a good purpose, but conceivably, he could have a good purpose for allowing a bad thing. We sense, don't we, that that's where the resolution of our problem has to locate. We've got to say more than that, but I think I can with confidence assert that it must have come from a good God with a good purpose for the utilization of a bad thing. All right, number seven. We'll ask later, what was the good use for the bad? Now, all we want to know is how God, the good God, could bring evil into being without producing it himself. We're sure he didn't produce it. It's blasphemy to say he did. God cannot be the author of evil. But on the other hand, it wouldn't be if he had not ordained it, permitted it, allowed it for what we know must be a good purpose. Now, just exactly what the good is that God will bring by allowing the evil to exist we don't have to settle now. All that's necessary at this juncture is to say that it is thinkable. And indeed, it's the only thing that's thinkable in this situation. I'm inclined to think that from the good purpose of a good God, evil has come into being. Number eight, as we try to find more particularly, how it could, we notice, it must have come from the good creatures God made. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because this creature we've been talking about ourselves has a mind, and being in the image of God has certain morality, and is therefore capable of immorality, and he could, though good, conceivably do evil as God, unchangeably, perfectly good, could not conceivably do evil. We say it must have come. It couldn't come from the blackboard. It couldn't come from the podium. It has to come from a person such as I am or you are a being who, like God, can be moral, but unlike God, is able to fall away from his morality. It must have come from the good creatures God made because it was capable of coming from that source, as it was not capable of coming from the divine source, and there is no other kind of source from which we could imagine it actually coming than a moral source which had fallen into immorality. Number nine, but they, man, angels, being good creatures, would seem to be no more capable of doing evil than their good creator. Many of my students know that in seminary, we've often wrestled with that question, how a good Adam, man, that's the name for a particular individual, as you know, in the Bible, it also is the word for man. And the great question is how this man, made in the divine image, with nothing but good in his original righteousness, could actually choose to do evil and thus he introduced it into the universe or the angels which preceded man, reduce, uh, producing it and 
bringing it into the universe of ours. But the question is, how could even he do it? After all, God is good and nothing but good, but man was good and nothing but good. We know full well if God created a creature in his image, he wouldn't have created an evil creature. He could only create a good creature. So we know that that first man or that fallen angel was like him. And so the question is, how could it, how could we fall away? But we have an answer here that doesn't exist in God. And that is number 10, but creatures may change as their creator cannot change. He is immutable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is good and never will be or ever could be anything but good or do anything but good, but that is not true of the good creatures he made. They, being changeable beings, would at least be capable of choosing the evil and falling away from the unmixed good of their character with which they were created. I'm not saying that necessarily is what happened at this moment. We're just saying to try to find a, a break in this solid wall of opposition to the existence of evil in a world created by a good God. It couldn't come from God, that's plain, but it at least theoretically, hypothetically could come from a good creature because a good creature is not unchangeably good. You remember how in the Gospels that young man came up to Jesus and called him good teacher and was rebuked for it? As Christ said, why do you call me good? None is good save God. Now that was the son of man, it was altogether good. Jesus Christ in his human nature never sinned. The prince of this world came and could find nothing in him. He taught us to pray, forgive us our sins. He never prayed, forgive us our sins, because he never had any sins. To forgive. And yet he says, why do you call me good? Nobody, even I, in my human nature, a good. Only God is good. What do you mean by that? He is good. In his human nature, he never was anything but good. And yet he insists he's not good. Only God is good. You see what he means by that, of course. Real goodness is unchangeable goodness. Jesus the man did not have that. Jesus as a man, insofar as a man, considering him only as a man and not the deity he was in human nature, which the rich young ruler didn't know, and so on, it was possible for him. Here again, you'll think I'm on the edge of heresy, but I say deliberately and without fear of violating the doctrine of Jesus Christ, that it was possible for him as a man, insofar as he was a man, to have departed from his goodness. And the only goodness which he considered worthy the name was that goodness which belonged to God because of its unchangeableness. Now it is true that Jesus as a man could never have fallen from his sin. But why? Not because Jesus as a man was good, but because Jesus as a man was in personal union with God. He was a divine person who had a human nature. And the reason he couldn't fall was not because he was a human being, but because he was a divine person with the human nature. According to the Bible, 
the saints in heaven will not be able to fall out of heaven as they fell out of the garden. Why? Because they're suddenly good? No. Why do you call the angels? Why do you call the saints in glory good? None is good save God. And the reason they cannot fall from heaven is not because they as creatures are good. It's because God has promised to keep them ever from falling. It's always the same thing, you see. God alone is good. God alone is unchangeable. God alone cannot do evil. And whenever a human being is unable to do it, it will be not because he's a good human being, but because he is established by an unchangeable deity in his goodness. But as we come back to our basic problem here of the origin of evil, we realize this is where it must have been, the only place from which it could have come, and at the same time that it is produced by a creature of God, God has absolutely nothing to do with the producing of the evil itself. He produces a good creature who, being a creature, is able to fall away from the goodness in which he is created and thus bring evil into our cosmos with all the ghastly problems which it has raised. I hope, my friends, that though you realize there's a good deal more to be said about this subject, that fundamentally that is not only the Christian answer, but it's the only answer that at the same time acknowledges the terrible verity of evil and preserves the character of divine goodness, impeccable and unchangeable forever.